Hey everybody, so I am working on my next Instagram video and I think I'm gonna do Rossini. <laughs> it's really exciting because rehearsals begin for me in about a week, week and a half, so I'm beginning to actually look at all the music. We're squeezing a lot of programs into a really short amount of time. So I'm beginning to go back to the, the way I used to do these Instagram videos and that is by preparing the music that I'm actually preparing for work. So I'm looking at Rossini and it's La Gaza Ladra. I might be completely Butcher, butchering the actual pronunciation of La Gaza Ladra. La Gaza Ladra. That's, I mean, I know that's terrible. That's, I don't know. Know this piece a little bit? Well, yeah, a little bit. I mean, it's Rossini, so it all kind of has the same, well, you know it's Rossini. But that doesn't make it bad music, and I'll get to that. So I've heard this piece a lot as a young player and as a orchestra musician, but I actually have rarely played it. I've not played this piece a, a, a lot. And like a lot of Rossini, I think as bass players, for bass players who are listening, we are very familiar with the uh... Uh, oh. I think you can all name that tune. That is, of course, the Rossini duo for cello and double bass. Honestly, what makes Rossini's music great is because it has a simplicity, but also has a wit and a charm about it that has always made the music very inviting. If my memory serves me correctly, ever since his music was written, he was very popular as a composer. Because sometimes, y'all, if you, the music is super accessible in many ways for different audiences and different storylines and all that kind of thing, it just makes the music more popular. Imagine that. So, uh, not to say that artists should only be writing for popularity, because um, I think we see enough of that already in pop culture, <laughs> but uh, uh, it worked for Rossini, and I, you could say that Rossini was kind of like a pop star in, in classical music. So I don't have much to say else about the piece, and I am just looking at this lick. This is at three in the overture, and I have, I'm, um, I mean, I'm not, generally I'm reading this on the spot, but again, since I'm working for work, getting ready for work, and my hour, practicing hours are very strange, I looked at this a little bit in different times, sometimes in the middle of the night. I'm not kidding. Very quietly with my practice moves, just looking over notes and getting fingerings. Um, but now I'm going to do it in a way so I'm, I'm actually able to make a video and perform for y'all. So three, we have a very, very Rossini-esque kind of sequence here. This, uh, um, so Rossini, because he's a little bit, he's lighter, it's a little more Mozartian than it is Wagnerian. So I don't, it would be very strange for Rossini to have this, then, no, uh, uh, to have this really, really con uh, s sustained. I, even, it's even hard for me to, to fake it, because <laughs> I'm still putting a space, but I think in Rossini, with the accents, it's just a little bit, there's a little bit of a demarcation of the note, but it's not necessarily, because it just doesn't quite sound like Rossini. It doesn't quite sound right. So I'm gonna put those spaces, and, we have, and then we have this, and then, <laughs> again, it's not Wagner, so you probably would have a. We here it's very, very natural to get off of the tie, off. It helps with timing. I don't know why I'm slipping on the stool today, y'all. <laughs> um, yeah, to have that, if you want to do this tie, it's very Rachmaninoff-esque or Wagnerian, this, which works for Wagner and, and Rachmaninoff, but a little less for Rossini. So it's okay, as far as I'm concerned, to cut these off a little bit on the tie. So when I say cut it off, cut it off on the tie, you have a quarter note, that's tied over to an eighth note. You can almost get rid of that eighth note and use that as a recovery moment. Recovery, y'all. Recoveries are really important. It's how we get back to the bow. So, off. So I can get back to a part of the bow that's comfortable to play. Because if I go, this is less comfortable. Because the stroke I'm trying to do is kind of this Martelet-esque, Spiccato-esque, brush-esque stroke. <laughs> Which is this. So, easier to do closer to the frog than it is to do out in out further in the stick. So I do off. Same thing here. And like a little Rossini, you can just cut and paste. <laughs> yeah. All the same stuff. Now the only 
only thing um, uh, I would probably like to talk about and accentuate a little bit is the, the harmonic story that's being told. So we have this. We're really happy about E major here. And then fine, this is the five, so we're in B major. Good, and then we have, we go to a minor key, E minor now. Interesting. And he does that to actually go to this applied chord, this D major. Uh, so if it's an applied chord, this D, where what are we applying it to? It's to the G major that comes after it. So now we're in the dominant of G. Uh, so, and that takes us to the G. Lo and behold, look at that. It's like a little, little miracle there. The reason I'm bringing that up is this is where the chords and the colors and no matter what we're playing, these harmonies can actually start to change the way we play because it's very resolute when we go to the B and then we go back to the E, but then this is that's a little, almost a little bit of a surprise. And then we, we and land comes playing that G. So we want to show that. And with all these, there will always be direction. So direction and then to go to the high E. Now come off. that B, which is the dominant, and the key B, same thing, go and then back off, to get back to E, same thing, so there's always, it's always shapes, always shapes y'all, because that's the way just music works and it sounds better that way. <laughs> Doesn't sound better that way, but it's actually just the language of music. So hopefully, when you study all these things in harmony class and uh, at school, it all starts to make sense because it's not all. They don't teach you these things just to kind of torture you through college. It actually is, as I've said this before, it helps teach you the language. And you learn the language of music, which is really important if you want to become a musician, <laughs> or really important if you just want to learn more about music and dig deeper because, and I'll, uh, this will be my quick aside moment with Joe, is when I was talking about Rossini being kind of lighter music, um, it is, I mean, because it's not, it's not complex in its harmony or its structure. However, those composers who do go further in that complexity, and well, I, I say that, well, almost with an asterisk, because Rossini wrote some really powerful music. We, um, we just performed, what was it? I believe it may have been the Stabat Mater. Is that what? I, and it actually it was it it's it's um, what Verdi based um, I believe um, the a lot of his Requiem off of. It's a beautiful piece, really, really, really nice. So when it was time for Rossini to get serious, <laughs> he could do so really, really well. But that to say, as you go to composers, let's say like Wagner or like Mahler. Sometimes that deeper knowledge of this storytelling through harmony and counterpoint enables the listener to be more involved in that musical journey and the story that's actually trying to be told through music and not through words, which is pretty remarkable. So, and I've said this before, that's why to me music is such a special and unique profession and, and hobby or love because I, I feel like even with a piece like Beethoven 5, which I've played a gazillion times, I'm always discovering something new and I can always learn something different from it based on performances, based on conductors, based on my mood, based on my perspective, because now I've actually conducted the first moon of Beethoven 5, which gave me a very different perspective than playing um, the, the uh, first movement of Beethoven 5. And it's remarkable. It really is. And that's what makes it so exciting. I mean, the whole journey of music is remarkable how much is almost new and fresh every single time. And that's one reason why I love music. I love this profession. This, even the classical portion is actually allowing us to, in many ways, use sounds and use harmonies to, to more reflect the human experience and the human soul. And any genre that helps us get there musically 
um, is to me very, very exciting. And when you start to wrap all this stuff, it's stuff up, these different elements, it just becomes like this world that's never ending. It can be pretty torturous on the soul <laughs> the, the more you dig in, because when you dig in deeply, you might hear some stuff that really, oh, it's just, it's, it's just, I mean, it's completely, I can't explain it in words, but that's just one of the, the joys and, and um, uh, miraculous things, I mentioned miracles already, uh, about music and music making. And I hope that you experience the same in your journey. Now, some of you might be like, I just want to learn to play the notes. And that's fine. That's, that's great. But y'all, I've said this before, and I will say it again. The notes are not the end. The technique is not the end. They are a means to an end. We learn all these things, and we learn all these techniques, and we develop all these tools to be able to better express ourselves and express our soul and connect with people in this unbelievably human way. It makes us unique on this planet uh, to be able to do that. So anyway, I leave you with that. That's your moment with Joe. Okay, back to the receiving. So what's after that? We have this... Yo, this, these trills are so fast, and some people are like, how do you do these trills? Um, these trills, oh, I don't have bar numbers, but I do have um, rehearsal numbers. So this is starting, I just ended all of that little sequence. One, two, three, four, five, six, seven, eight. This is eight before four. I get this all the time, like, how do you do the trills so fast? Because it is really fast. If this is so fast, I'm hardly even thinking of a trill. I'm thinking of it more of it as a turn. So... And it's the trill is it's already hard at that tempo and it goes a lot faster so I'm almost thinking of it as oh no we one two so, I think that's what it is I haven't played this slowly yet y'all so yeah it's just so it's basically a turn So again, the trill would be because there's a it's a trill and then it has an F sharp G. So I'm basically just going to turn that into a turn by going um, uh, just the so it's just it's actually just one trill and then and then um, finishing out the music as Rossini indicates. And same thing here, basically just the uh, up and down. So A B A as written and then. Same thing, C, D, uh, C, B, C. And that's how I would do, th do that, particularly when it's up to tempo. So, do, I can even practice it that way. Uh, sometimes when you're doing bowings, it's really important to think about what helps which hand the best, particularly when things get fast and complicated. So in this portion of the overture, the we have this so i already discussed about the two plus one or so it's one plus two one plus two and then two plus three and i'll do that so it's one and then here's two here's one the plus two here's the two plus one in the triplet fashion the last one is now i did the, a different bowing just uh, um, uh, a fingering just to make a point if you could do this fingering where you can use open string, then use another open string, and then change on that third triplet, and then... I find that difficult, mainly because that pattern, when it's done really fast, can be really complicated. For example, the faster it goes, um, let's say, let's, I'm going to take the left hand out of it and go... Uh, yes, so this is with the current... Boeing that I have now, I'll do it slowly. So one, two, three, two, three, two. So that is the Boeing. And or, because of that, when it's fast, that, that last little triplet is gonna be really annoying. It would get on my nerves. So I'm, I would think, well, is there anything I can do to make that easier? Well, it's the same G, but what if I play that on the D string instead? So then, so I'll do it again. Hmm. Now, if you think about it,
about it, if I just do the right hand, that's way easier. Versus, <laughs> that, that, that to me is way more difficult. So for that reason, I will play the second triplet on the D string. And then, um, and then two plus one is easier there. Uh, because you have the two on the D string, and then the, the, the separate is on the A string, which is also easier. So these are the things to think about that might make playing the excerpt easier. So now I'm about to practice this excerpt of La Gaza Ladra <laughs> uh, by Rossini. I put the metronome on 110, and we're just going to, just to do this assessment, it goes way faster than this. So here we go. fingerings because there are many ways to play that scale. <laughs> to me would be a disaster. I just, because it's just too much of this. It's like playing German bone. Who wants to do that? <laughs> just kidding, just kidding. I don't want to, yes, just kidding. I'm just, that was a joke. That was a joke. <laughs> kind of. Uh, but <laughs> No, but I mean, the, and I should probably do a video talking about German bow versus um, French bow. And I shouldn't say versus, because that makes it sound like it's a competition. In some places it is. I think at, any, at the end of the day, you should be able to play well. But there are definitely advantages. But there are definitely advantages of playing one bow versus the other that I will completely concede. Like German playing loudly on German, so much easier than French. It is. It's just it. It's just the way it naturally. But being super super nimble, eh, we might have our advantages being able to do this with the um, with the French bow versus the German bow. So we all we have to it goes come kind of to picking our poison. Uh, uh, and sticking with it. Or you can learn to do both. So you could to have the best of both worlds, right? That's the way it could work. Anyway, so uh, let's try this again. So I'm going to need to do this further out in the sticks. I feel like I have more control. in box sometimes with the one plus two bowing I scoot the bow because I uh, if it's only if I, if I have to do the same amount of bow or the same amount of yeah same amount of bow or I have one note and then I have two notes I have to be able to move the bow a little bit more on the one note so I can make up for the fact that it's not playing two notes so no thinking about as I continue to crank the tempo up and we'll see. Ooh, this is moving a little bit. Uh. I'm getting there y'all. Practice. 
practice does make better, maybe not perfect. <laughs> His 140. And as a reminder, I'm not looking at this for the first time. I did look at this maybe two days ago, again, like in the middle of the night and did some work on it yesterday. So some of these patterns are a little bit more into my DNA. So, you know, I'm not just reading this and going like, poof, it, 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 it doesn't happen like that. But I am reviewing because it's gonna make playing it up the tempo, particularly when I do my Instagram video, easier for sure. Uh, I'm gonna do 150, I'm gonna play the whole thing. And this is close to tempo, let's see what happens. I'm playing further out. Generally, sometimes the rosin get a little bit out there, but I just want to, I need that traction to keep the clarity, particularly as it goes to the lower string by the third bar. Better. Yeah, that's much better. <laughs> it's a little, the rosin is a little, um, how can I say? When you put on a new rosin, it can sometimes grab the string, particularly on the higher strings, a little, uh, I'm, I'm working it out, working out the kinks. <laughs> yeah, it's like that. to myself play this and I think I'm really close to um, putting this out there putting this out into the world and hopefully you, I hope you're enjoying these behind the kind of behind the scenes looks on how I behind the scene look it's a behind the scenes look that's what it is behind the scenes look at putting these videos together and what it's like practicing and um, I've enjoyed kind of sharing it in this way because uh, it's like I'm practicing with all these wonderful people. So I hope you're you're enjoying. If you are there, if there are other things you'd like to see, let me know in the comments. Because I'm happy to try out some other things that might work. But in the meantime, I'm going to record, uh, listen to myself, give a report, and then I'll start recording for our Instagram. So comments. I listen to myself and I sound a, a bit orchestral. <laughs> so. So that direction. But I'm wondering. I was wondering if I could have a little bit more quality in, in all these arpeggios because they start to sound a little mundane. <laughs> or, but something a little more. Bi
vibrant to make it a little more sparkly. <laughs> could be a difference of listening between this microphone and the microphone on my phone which is really close to my um, really close to my bass but I maybe a little bit a little shorter it's a little more controlled because when I it sounded like it rang too much like it was a little too well but a little more control Sounds better, y'all. We'll see. About to record. Mm -hmm. 